Jesper, welcome, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good, Ben. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. So really, really excited to have you on here and just really excited as well, like personally, just to get get the podcast going again. It's been some months once I've settled into my new job, but really glad to have you um, on board. And you came highly, highly recommended by uh, Melissa Waddingham and as someone who knows an awful lot about mushrooms, wild food in all sorts of different aspects as well and i'm sure we're gonna uh, dive into a lot of those but um yeah just wanted to welcome you to to the show and um and maybe just ask you a, a kickoff question uh like what got you started in the journey of sort of mushrooms and and maybe you can go on your different tangents as well but specifically mushrooms like how long have you been interested in mushrooms um best part of 40 years probably 40 years um I I been to gosh I was a long time I know <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of scary to think about um, I mean I guess as, as a brief bit of background as a kid um, I had a I had a huge amount of freedom as a kid and when I was maybe four or five my folks bought a place in the middle of nowhere in the middle of France it was a, a dilapidated cottage which they they put their kind of love and, and energy into into kind of revitalizing, bringing, bringing back into, you know, functional space. But it was mm -hmm. literally in the middle of nowhere. There were no kids to hang out with. And we'd, as a family, we'd go there for Easter holidays and summer holidays, pretty much the whole of the summer holidays, like a six-week chunk. Um, and as I say, there, was, there wasn't a lot to do other than get to know the natural world around me. So because I had this freedom, I was... I was free to wander up and down the roads and, you know, the, the lanes and um, used to climb over into the farmer's fields and, you know, explore the rivers and the streams and find toads and tadpoles and butterflies and insects. Um, and so I think that was, that was the kind of, that, that was a kind of really formative experiences where I, I developed that, that, that connection with the natural world. You know, it, it it gave me gave me lots of lots of joy and lots of pleasure. And at the time, I lived in Manchester. Um, or well, I, I was in California for a short period of time, but we got moved to Manchester age age six or seven. And if you know Manchester, it's wet. Yeah. And and I you know I I I got to know friends there, I'd hang out at my friends' houses, and there was one autumn when it'd been particularly wet, and their back garden this huge mushroom had come up. Uh, on a tree stump you know, it was the blackening polypore but it looked really impressive and at the end of their road they had access to a park um, in South Manchester and uh, the space in there just filled up with fungi it was an area that we'd go all the time never saw mushrooms and suddenly there were things all over the place um, kind of going a little way back probably about a year prior to that my my mother who's Danish had been sent a a poster by one of her her Danish relatives, and it was a small poster that she stuck on the fridge, and it was pictures of mushrooms, and it had maybe fifteen or twenty different species on there. It had death cap and destroying angel, you know the ones with the with the the skull and crossbone beside them. But it had a nice bunch. It had the fly agaric as well, the red white spots, kind of classic fairy fairy tale toadstool. But it had porcini and shaggy ink caps and you know and uh, parasol mushrooms a nice selection of edible species and those had you know either one or two dinner plates beside them and there was one day so it was on it was and i was you know i'd soaked it up i guess um but i wasn't interested in fungi as such but i went to school one day and on the way to school there was this mushroom growing out of a crack in the pavement and it was one of the ones which i knew was on the chart the shaggy, shaggy, shaggy ink cap. So it's one of the, the easy species for, for novices to identify. But back from school, I picked it, brought it back home, and you could literally superimpose it over the picture on the poster, and it was identical. It was my mum, who's because she's Danish, she's maybe maybe um, a bit less uh, microphobic than than the Brits are. Yeah. So she said, "Hell, let's eat it." Now, here's the interesting thing. At the time, I hated mushrooms. Um, you know, I, the way my mum prepared button mushrooms, just I loathed them with a vengeance. Because I found this, I ate it, and I was happy to eat it. 
and it tasted completely different from the mushrooms that, that I'd eaten beforehand. So that was my first experience. That was probably eight or nine years old. That's and quite, say, a, then, quite a brave thing to do. Was that just you on your own? You just found this mushroom and you decided to eat it? Uh, well, well, my... Or, or my you, was someone my, overseeing my, you or... <laughs> Well, my parents, it? my parents agreed with me. So okay. I mean, by that point, I'd, I'd been, um, you know, I'd been catching all sorts of different um, butterflies in France and then identifying them. And mm. I also been kind of identifying, identifying some flowers. They knew that my ID skills were, you know, I guess, as good as it could be for a child of that age. But just the fact that it was it was unmistakably the same species. Yeah. We just we just went. You know, this is before the internet, so there wasn't the opportunity to go and post on a, and you know, take a picture by a Google lens or post on a Facebook group. Um, and then having having had that experience, I then got um, an initial book on wild mushrooms. Um, so then this next this next year, where we found all these mushrooms in the back of you know, in the park at the end of my friend's um, friend's little road. I had a mushroom book to do some comparison between, so we're trying to identify. And you know, the mushroom book was very rudimentary. It maybe had a hundred pictures in of a hundred different species, um, and that that was it. So I know now that if you if you've got a really small ID book, you try and do best fit. But there are thousands. I mean, many thousands, ten, fifteen, you know, uh, more more thousands of species in the UK, um, and you know, I. I it wasn't necessarily good enough to uh, to really gain gain confidence with. And then in 1981, Roger Phillips' mushroom book came out, and at some point I was given gifted that as a as a present, and that was a game changer for me because because I could really get to grips and really feel like I was getting close to identifying exactly what the things I was finding was. Uh, we had a um, there was a small park called Marrow Louise Gardens in Didsbury. <clears throat> In Manchester, and that was my that became my hunting ground. So when it was wet in summertime, I'd just go and walk down to the park, and it was called Squirrel Park. There were squirrels all over the place, and I'd and I'd observe the squirrels and their relationship with mushrooms, and I'd go collect species, bringing them back home to identify. And I don't know, I, I don't know if it's something you've ever done as a kid, but but I but I've encountered a few a few kids uh, on forays who have done a similar kind of thing. What I would do during winter time and springtime, when I wasn't expecting some guy to be around, I'd be looking through, I'd be thumbing through the pages of Roger Phillips' mushroom books from the beginning to the end of it, soaking up the content in it and looking at the pictures. And then when it got to summer and autumn and the mushrooms started popping up. I mean, I'd go out, I'd see something that I'd never encountered in the wild beforehand. And I'd pretty much be able to tell you exactly which page it was on in Roger Phillips' mushroom book. So there was that kind of, I guess, some degree of photographic memory thing going on. Wow. Um, and that just, that just continued. I, 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 and I had that connection with nature and there were lots of different things that I connected with. Um, I started getting into wild food more broadly and eating some, some, um, uh, edible greens, for example. I even made an experimental wine, uh, which I was told I wasn't allowed to drink any of. <laughs> but I made a broom, broom wine at some point with the uh, the help of my granddad. Um, and by the time I was 14 or 15, I had maybe I had for between 40 or 50 different edible species under my belt. And initially, what would happen is my parents would always be cross referring with me. I'd say, "This is what I think it is," and they cross refer, and we we'd, and they'd say. Do not think it could be this one that's poisonous. And I would I would give a sound justification for why it was. And eventually they'd been convinced to eat it. Um, and I'd uh, educate my my friends as well. You know, we just go on walks and I'd, I'd see something and I'd tell them what it was. I, some of my friends weren't very interested in it, but uh, I had a friend who ended up going into the chefing trade. Mm -hmm. So when he was chefing, he'd have access to porcini and chanterelle mushrooms. And then when we go out and we, we go on the all, you know, forays together and I'd be introducing him to a whole load of species which weren't available, by, you know, in the food market. But he then, mm. you know, I put them up with him and it was like, wow, they're my favorite of all mushrooms. Um, there's a family of fungi of, of, of mushrooms called the Rushula, yeah. or the brittle gills. And 
um, a lot of fridges avoid them because some are very acrid or bitter or unpleasant tasting. Some are described as poisonous, but a lot are edible. And if you can if you can identify the edible species, they're absolutely wonderful. One of my favourite group of fungi. Where uh, would you play? Where would you place that? Because I, I often, you know, they're one of the most common things you find in quite a lot of woodland, aren't they? Um, but I've I've always, you know, I do I do do the nibble test sometimes, but I've never been really over uh, eager to take them home and really cook them up. And I, I was just thinking, where do you place them in your hierarchy of delicious mushrooms? And and also, I guess the good question is, what what, what how would you best prepare a rusula specifically? Just any any dish like you'd normally would, or yeah, pretty and versatile. I, yeah, I mean they're pretty versatile. One thing I like about them is they, um, you know, there are some that are very good raw, nuttiness to them, like kind of creamy nuttiness um, in their raw state. But when they cook, they have a tendency to, they they have a texture, and it's not identical, but it's not far off the texture of scallops. So the white, the white, you know, muscle part of the scallop, mm. um, and and I like a pan of pan of rushlas, just you know, chopped, fairly uh, chunky, and sautéed in butter with a little bit of salt and pepper until they're getting just around the edges, and just a pile a mound of those on a simple piece of toast is mind blowing. I mean, they are they are great. They don't have the sweetness and that depth of flavour that you get from a gene, for example. Yeah, but I sometimes find you know. I, I love porcini, but you know, they're, they're almost too rich to have a lot of. You might want to actually cook a huge amount of them. It's a bit intense, but that flavor is incredible as a as a tool to permeate through a dish. But it's not it's not the same as you know something that you could really just go at and really enjoy. Um, so they're, I mean, if you haven't dabbled with them, something to consider. Um, yeah. You might be surprised but what i would also say is that the majority of foragers i know don't touch them and that just means if i hit the woods and the porcini have been been mopped up or are not fruiting then there are other things to, to, to find them there's you said the diversifying your kind of array of species that you that you work with because it just means there you know, there are more options mm. when so when I was a kid, yeah. food, food was, I, mean, I guess, you know, it, it, it feels quite daring, you know, the idea of, of picking something from the wild, you know, fungi, mushrooms in general, toadstools, there are always connotations about how toxic they are. And, you know, you get, 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 get it wrong, then, you know, you, that might be your last, the last meal yeah. you ever, ever have. And there's truth in that, absolutely. Um, I, I kind of, I quite, I found that quite appealing. I like that kind of, it seemed like there was a bit of a risk, but I wasn't taking risk because I was being, you know, uh, very thorough and exacting about my different, you know, if I had any doubts about something, and I wouldn't eat it. But it still felt, felt quite, um, quite something that nobody else at the time that I knew was doing that. Um, but I've got to say that I was, I was fascinated by fungi broadly as well. You know, things that had crazy shapes, things like stink horns and morel mushrooms, which obviously are gourmet, but just look incredible. Um, truffles took, took, you know, they, I'd, I'd read about truffles in, um, in Roger Phillips' mushroom book. And, and I think I had a couple of other books by that time, which, which had mention of truffles. I, you know, and they sounded incredible. They also sounded like something that was, you know, impossible to find unless you mm. you had some really special skills. And even though they were mentioned, you know, the summer truffle was was you know found in the UK, it still felt like some you'd have to just be you know it, it'd be like winning the lottery to find those. Not something that I could find or you know I, I I could expect to find. So they they kind of remained off off radar for me for you know a couple of decades, I guess. After then, um, if not more, I've only I've only been I really had truffles on radar with you know within the last 10 years i would say what was your first experience with uh truffles when we're talking truffles broadly so i mean there mm. there are you know when people talk about truffles they're often just a small selection of the gourmet edible species the majority being in the genus tuber 
So um, tuber estivum is the summer truffle of this fairly large black truffle that we get in the UK. It's not one of the best, but it's still pretty good. Um, truffles, uh, I mean, mycologists, you know, people who study fungi will often talk about truffles and they're, they're talking about species which grow underground. And that includes a tuber, but it also includes a whole bunch of other different species as well. And in the UK, we have somewhere between 80 and 90 different species, possibly even slightly over 90 of these that have been recorded. So, you know, there, there are lots of different species that you can encounter on the ground. Um, it, uh, it took me by surprise to actually realize there were so many different species in the, yeah. in the UK, because all the mushroom guides I had, if they mentioned truffles, they mentioned two or three species. Mm. Okay, and usually the summer truffle from the UK, and they'd have pictures of of the uh, the white truffle or the black truffle, the Perigord black truffle of France. Well, found found in different parts of Europe, um, but generally kind of associated with as the as the French gourmet truffle and the white truffle being the Italian gourmet truffle. Um, so you know, it didn't didn't seem as if we had many you know many options in the UK. No, uh, when you told when you told me the other day that there was ninety, I was I was pretty blown away. To be fair. Um, I, th I knew there was more than like three or four, you know, but I thought it was in the maybe early 20s, but 90s, uh, quite a big chunk up, isn't it? Well, one so of the interesting things about um, Roger Phillips' Mushroom Guide is that is that he he compiled that by attending numerous fungi forays, official you know, British Mycological Society fungi forays that, that were being held at various different locations around the country over a series of, I think it was over about five years. So he was photographing species that mycologists were identifying. And the fact that he doesn't have a whole lot of other species truffle in there is because they weren't, they weren't, they weren't showing up on fungal forex, mm. which makes you, makes you think that they weren't there. But the reality is they will have been there, just out of sight. That thing about growing on the ground, they're, 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 they're not seen unless they're intentionally sought out or you know, rapidly encountered when they by something else, for example. A, a, quick, a quick question just on that. So, um, and maybe you can re explain why truffles grow underground, but um, are all these 90 species um, growing underground for the same reasons as the co common mushrooms that we know, you know, in terms of? Uh, you know, I'll probably fudge this. You know, they're doing it to basically get dug up and eaten by wildlife so that they can then spread their spores, right? Do they all grow underground for the same reason, or, or some of them got a different purpose for, for why they're growing underground? Don't know. If I we, think from, we... from from that's a great question. Um, from from what we know, uh, on the truffles, and I'm going to use the word truffle to describe you know, any of those eighty or ninety species growing underground. They, they, it's an evolutionary adaptation, uh, a more recent evolutionary adaptation. So actually, within the truffles, we've got we've got a whole load of, of, of different species, but they're actually representatives of different different genera, genera different families. Of them. Right. So there are members of the milk cat family, members of the rushula family, the brittle gill family. Uh, we've got members of the Paziza family and the Helvella family. Um, are actually represented in 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 truffle form. So wow. all these different. I mean, it's quite interesting that because we're talking about you know quite significant gaps in evolutionary terms. But these different groups of fungi have have independently adapted to grow underground at some point more recently in more recent history. Um, and my my I guess my not my understanding, but my my take on it is that by growing on the ground they're in conditions which are much more stable mm. so they're, they're they're not having to come up and under with with rain having come down so they so they can then to allow them to grow to then to then flourish and get to maturity above ground for example it gets very dry and they don't they don't achieve maturity so by being able to mature slowly underground where conditions are more stable um, they optimize their chance of reaching maturity. However, the challenge of truffles is by being underground. If they hit maturity and decay underground, they're not extending their um, their seed in a sense. They're not spreading spreading their seeds. So all truffles have adapted 
the vast majority of them have have some degree of smell that they kick off at maturity. So they you know, an aroma comes out of them to allow them to be detectable at, at soil surface mm. by by um, primarily rodents, um, but but dif different mammals will dig, dig truffles up um, and uh, they'll they then ingest it and the spores are passed passed intact within their fecal material where they're spread is spread throughout the woods. So it's uh, I mean, it seems like a pretty sound um, rationale for doing what they do. Yeah, for sure. Sure. And 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 on this, I know we t we were going to touch on this a little bit, but uh, you've had quite a bit of experience of uh, finding truffles, not necessarily with a helping a, a little helper that sniffs the ground although you might argue otherwise there might be some other sniffing of the ground there that you might mention yeah. but um yeah. so can you just talk about that and you know some some sort of uh experiences that you've had in terms of how, how have you gone about finding truffles um in the past and and it'd be great if you could just give some like some top tips for anyone who's wanting to go and uh, sustainably and carefully and sensibly forage our, our like native woods um, for truffles. Like, what would you say to them if they were? Yeah, you know, first of all, is it possible? Uh, and then, second of all, is how would you do it? Well, I mean, in terms of is it possible, um, I would be so bold as to say that there are truffles in every woods in the UK. Every wow. woodland in the UK will produce truffles, and not necessarily having the fruiting bodies at the moment. But mycelium will be will be present in pretty much every wood in the UK of some of those 80 or 90 different species. Um, and, and can I ask a quick question? Is that regardless of whether, because I've got it in my head, you know, from reading various sources, that one of the big checkboxes you need is is chalky limestone soil, right, and the correct pH. So are you saying, regardless of that, any any woodland, or are you saying any woodland as long as it has that right sort of pH? Or is that uh, is that statement only really valid for this certain select you know, highly gastronomic, well, highly prized truffles. Um, just wanted to. Get yeah, well, cool. well, you, you pretty much answered it there. That that yes, the the kind of more highly prized species, the tuber species varieties in particular, are, are usually not all. They're usually found in association with more alkaline soil like chalk and limestone, for example. Um, but there are there are plenty of species that thrive in uh, acid soil environments or more neutral soil so and you're going to find different species in different parts of the country depending on whether you're more alkaline or more more acidic but if you know if you're interested in just seeing if independently you can find truffles you can mm. experiment by exploring your local park or or any local woodlands and it's um it's one of those things that because we do have this mindset that they are something you know elusive you're not mm. going to be able to find to go out and to and to look for what I call truffle sign like clues, evidence evidence that truffles have been extracted by by um, some wildlife from an area. Um, if you if you look for truffle sign, that's like one in ten ten sites that I explore. Probably less than that, maybe one in five yield something. You will, will yield yield a truffle of sorts, um, which is a pretty good return. So what are what are the main things that you're looking out for? I mean, some of these will probably come naturally to you right now, but like trying to think of those things that come to you naturally, and then also the obvious things that you look for. Like what what are these what are these things that you look for? Well, there's 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 one. I mean, the the first time I encountered truffles uh, or a species of truffle was um, uh, by finding a species of fungus that parasitizes truffles. And they actually protrude from the ground, so they're almost like a like a flag, saying the truffles are here. Um, not exciting truffles, I must point out. Um, but these are these are species that are related to cordyceps, which are a fungi that parasitize the fungi, but also uh, kind of better known for for parasitizing insects, different different forms of wildlife. And um, just just for just for. The layman's terms, parasitizing. You're basically saying living off, eating other mush a mushroom, eating a mushroom, basically. Well, we've we've got a species in the UK that doesn't grow nothing to do with truffles, but it, it it's uh, it's called the um, caterpillar club, and this species of fungus will actually parasitize caterpillars, 
and when the when the caterpillars um, buried on the ground at some point it fully digests the caterpillar and then sprouts this orange spike out of its head that that, that is visible in the grass that it's uh, typically found in moss grass that um, and so this orange club sticking out of the ground is a clue that if you if you um, excavate it lo and behold you find the caterpillar mm. or the pupa um, that's been that's been eaten and it's a similar kind of principle so this this um, um, Caterpillar club that I was collecting uh, is one called the snake's snake's tongue uh, truffle club, and it it produces these kind of green black spikes that grow out of the top of the truffles. Quite hard to see because they tend to grow in mixed woodlands. I mean, I typically find these under either under conifers in plantations or um, under beech trees. But if you can spot these little black clubs sticking out of the ground, excavate down below and you find something called a deer truffle. Okay, nice. And is that so an that, edible? I know I've uh, heard of the deer truffle. Is that <laughs> deer, deer truffles? Are, they're, they're quite cool. They're probably the most pieces of truffle in the UK, um, or certainly the one the most common one that I've encountered. And there are a few different species. There are two quite common ones: ones with conifers and one with with um, broad trees. And they have a, a slightly granular. Uh, orange, orange brown exterior or peridium, which is the which is the term mycologists use. And if you slice it in half, they're powdery on the inside. So they, right. they have this very powdery black spore mass. Um, and most of the time then the texture's not very good. I've eaten young specimens and there's no aroma. I found old yeah. specimens that smell like kebab armpits. You know, they've oh, got a, they've, they've got a real oniony kind of um, quality to them. And you know maybe you could capture that aroma and use it use it in some kind of way. I like experimenting, but I haven't haven't to. Uh, I don't think it warrants that much experimentation. So yeah, sadly, yeah. They're, they're not gourmet. But it, it, it's uh, it's probably one of the. If you do start to um, look for truffle sign, and I'll give you some more details, more things to look for in a second. Mm. Then this is the likely species you'll encounter fairly early on. So it's. Um, it's it's nice because you find those, then you're doing the right thing and doing exactly the same thing that helps you find find these um, deer truffles will help you to find other more exciting truffles if you if you continue. It's a numbers game. Yeah. The more effort you put into to, to seeking truffles out without the aid of aid of a, of an animal other than yourself, um, the more the more rewards you're going to get. So what you're saying is basically, if you get these um, things to look out for and these natural signs correctly, you're going to be able to find truffles. But the one that you'll most probably end up finding first is probably this deer truffle. But you know, obviously, it's not for eating. But once you find that, you just you apply the same skills, probably just in a slightly different or more higher probability area, and you should hopefully be able to do the same thing and find some more of the gourmets. Is that what you're basically saying? Yeah, abs I, I'm absolutely. I mean, to be honest, um, you know, I've, I've, I do find a, quite a lot of these deer truffles, but actually over recent years, I think probably maybe one in three truffles I find is a deer truffle, but that means, you know, two in three is something different. Yeah. And some of those are very exciting species, really, really you know, really interesting. Either I, interesting from a food perspective or interesting from a mycological perspective. Bear in mind, 80 or 90 species we have in the UK, um, a lot of those are found very infrequently mm. because they're not they're not visible above ground. They're potentially an uncommon species, but actually because you know they're probably spread spread fairly wide around the UK, but are very rarely encountered. Um, and, and such a, it can be quite exciting. It's literally like you know finding treasure not of a food nature but of a fungal nature. Um, so. In terms of what I call truffle sign, let's kind of focus on on what yeah. you'd be looking for if you're if you're going out. The time of year that I I find a lot of species is summertime, kind of late June onwards, usually into July and August when the majority start showing up. And the place places that I find the majority that time of year are actually not in the woods; they're in parks. Or areas where you've got grassy verges with suitable trees having been planted planted in the same kind of location, um, and there are species which are growing mycorrhizally with the tree. 
reason why it's really easy to spot them is that there's no leaf litter on the ground, so you've got the grass, and what you're looking for is evidence, which is basically little dig holes in the so they could be kind of small one centimeter dig holes. They could be, if it's a you know a substantial summer truffle, they could be you know two, three, four inches across potentially. Mm. And it might not just be one dig hole. Often it's where there are you know two, three, four or dig holes under the boughs of the tree in the grass. And uh, that's usually good good truffle sign in summertime. Um, when you find dig holes in leaf litter later in the year. It can be truffles, but it can also be buried acorns, for example. You know, there are lots of different yeah. things that might be down there. It could just be, you know, an animal um, latrine and something. Some animals being there, you know, exploring the smell, for example. So it's, I, I find truffle sign in grassy areas is more reliable than truffle sign in wooded areas. But let's ignore the woods. Yeah. They're really good spaces. So in a grass area, obviously, it's not appropriate to go turfing up, you know, slicing a big big rectangle of, of grass and lifting the grass up and having a product underneath. You know, that's that that's not okay behavior. Yeah. So so what, what I do very simply is where there are existing dig holes is simply stick a couple of fingers into the hole. And it's a thing is that if you've got soil that's kind of fairly um friable, it's you know, it's got a it's got a bit of give to it pressure against the soil if there's a stone behind it you can feel the pressure of the stone it's very very hard the harder you push the more resistance there is if it's a truffle you'll find feel something that's slightly firm but it has a bit of give you can actually by using your fingers feel around in the hole and feel if so that it may be that the hole's been made by say a squirrel excavating and it's been disturbed before it's got to so sometimes one hopes. You'll find, yeah. yeah one hope one hopes but often, you know, if you think about how how fungi, you know, mushrooms above ground fruit, sometimes you'll have, you know, you find a porcini on its own, but sometimes you'll, you'll find two or three in close proximity. Mm. Same kind of thing can happen with truffles, where where the one that's being removed by the by the foraging rodent is the one that's giving off the smell, maybe at that point. Actually, with a bit of bit of prodding around, you find numbers two, three, four, and five in the vicinity that weren't picked out by the by, by the squirrel, for example. Um, so that that method is, it's an, an, a particularly in summertime, is, is you know, if you're seeing dig holes in grass in summertime, I'd say there's probably a, a good 50% chance that they're associated with truffles or truffles were there and it's, it's to do with excavation of them. Wow. And, and, and you're set, just to confirm, because I get really hung up on, oh, I need to be in a chalky limestone area, but this is for any area, more or less, are you saying, or largely in the UK, whether it is known as being a chalk limestone alkaline soil area or not? Well, I was, so I was, I was brought up um, in Manchester and I kind of I spent time out of Manchester, but also um, I, I'm currently living, living in the southeast down near Beaconsfield. Mm. Uh, I've been down here for four years, and I'm I, no, it, I'm in the Chilterns, so we've got yeah. you know, chalk and generally fairly alkaline soil around it. And this has been fun for me because I've been in a habitat where there not only are there interesting truffles uh, that I haven't been encountering around Manchester, um, they're also fungi that are fruiting above ground, which I've not mm. encountered before because I wasn't in the in the the correct habitat, should say. For them. But around Manchester, um, in the you know the years I was you know. Uh, Maybe five or six years when I was I was interested in, in truffles whilst I was up there, um, I found plenty of different species and some pretty interesting ones and some some ones which I enjoyed eating, um, even if they're they're maybe not highly valued. They're still definitely they have interesting aromas or qualities that you can capture and use in different ways. Um, so uh, I think getting if I, kind of if I hop back to my childhood, this is this is you know a tale about about morels rather than truffles but as, as a kid i was fascinated by by the appearance of of or what morels look like these kind of strange creature fungal creatures that apparently come up in the springtime and they have these they're hollow for one have this white stem with this convoluted sponge or it has a um kind of um honeycomb like effect on the on, on the top and i thought hey you know i want to find these and every spring 
energy into trying to find these things. You know, I'd, I'd be looking everywhere I was. I'd go to parks. I'd, you know, I'd walk. And I eventually came to the conclusion, hell, aren't, the, 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 sorry, there aren't morels in Manchester. It's simply, there aren't any. And I abandoned them, and I just, like, let go of, of looking. And then maybe 15 years later, and I'm not going to go into how, how it came about, but I, I finally discovered morels existed in Manchester. Oh, wow. And, and with, within a couple of years, I found different morels in Manchester and a hell of a lot of them. So, so it's, you know, it's interesting, the things you tell yourself to help to, because I, I, I used to tell myself there were no morels in Manchester because it helped, helped me to feel better about failing so bloody miserably <laughs> every, every springtime. It was like a wound to my heart, the fact that I didn't find them and I was out looking. It helped help me to to you know to feel better about myself yeah. by, by by convincing myself they weren't there, and maybe that's just, you know that's something it's a it's a trap you could fall into with truffles saying well yeah. I'm not on limestone, so therefore I'm unlikely to find any truffles and then therefore you know miss out on the opportunity. It's worth bearing in mind, like soilscape maps that that show that show you the alkalinity or the or the or the soil type thing, chalk or limestone, for example, particularly. Um, that's for finding a species. Okay, but you know, that, that that gives you a kind of a wide area to be thinking about focusing on. But you know, if you, if you look within within any area, there will be variation in soil soil acidity alkalinity. So you might have a dominant acid location, little pockets here and there, which actually have the ideal alkaline soil for mm. the species you might want to find. So I think it's easy to um, kind of put the blinkers on and kind of deny yourself the uh, the possibility yeah of finding something special it's a very good point I, I guess i was just wanting to um to know that i was not wasting my time by looking for all these natural signs looking for truffles in this area because you know maybe it's the wrong area but yeah i think i think i think it's a very good point you make you know um i am yet to find my first world morels it's it's not yet become a complete bane of my life but every spring i'm you know still still hoping but um i think i just need to get out a lot more <laughs> uh during the right times but um yeah morels eh? the elusive morels yeah well the, the the thing about morels is that they they like to grow in habitats that you you wouldn't conceive of of going to find a porcini or a chanterelle yeah uh, they're like weird locations they're like waste waste um waste sites um areas where you know, they even like like growing in um uh, building sites sometimes you know they they like they like growing in association with ash which is a tree species that you completely avoid ash woodlands when it comes yeah. to to you know interesting mycorrhizal species that you might be seeking out in you know species of summer ash is a complete no-go zone for those kind mm. of species but in springtime that's where you want to be if you want to find 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 wild morale there is also the um the i mean it's a bit of a cheat in a sense but that there are um if you want to find the else the place to go in really is aldi supermarkets where it, where a, a new aldi supermarket's been been put up and they've around the outsides of the car park laying down black pine bark mulch wood chip around mm. their their various plantings um there's a narrow window um, where if if the wood chip was laid maybe eight up, up to eight months beforehand, then there's a reasonable chance to come the following spring that actually morels are going to fruit upon it if conditions are right. But that's um, that's that's the way to find to find morels in the UK if you're desperate to see what they are. But actually, the wild one. So, yeah. And and just on that point as well, because I've heard very similar things about how to find morels, you know, look for the wood chips that have recently been laid down, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So does that mean then if you haven't managed to find that first window, say eight months later after being laid down, things were right, you've missed and maybe they did fruit there, but obviously you weren't around. Does that mean you've lost your chance? Because obviously a lot of mushrooms fruit in the same place year on year type of thing. Um, but are you are you saying that are you suggesting that maybe they would have 
had their fill, you know, moved on, or what, what's the situation there? Yeah, the the uh, the, the, the morels, the mycelium of the, the morels, um, you know, it feasts on the. I think it's glucagon, which is which is uh, released released from the um, ship and the, the nutrient there, um, and they basically decimate all the nutrient supply. So they kind of they. They, the fruiting that they have is a, you know, it's, it's a last surge. It's like a, like a, a, acknowledging that they're at the end of their capacity to be able to to fruit there in future. So they produce a huge number of fruiting bodies to maximise spore dispersal for for furthering the species else, right. elsewhere. Um, and occasionally, I hear occasional reports of people saying that they find find one or two on a on a mass fruiting site the year after. And if what some some you know some some kindly supermarkets will actually yeah, and when yeah, they yeah. do that, there's a possibility of a, of a subsequent fruiting the next year. But I've um, I haven't heard of you know almighty second fruitings ever. Um, they're usually fairly fairly modest. That's really interesting because um, not morels, but um, this year in our local little woodland you know that's very well managed and they have certain walkways which are just completely wood chipped and um last probably end of october november last year all these magic mushrooms started popping up <laughs> all the little wave, wavy caps um psilocybe cyanazens is that how you pronounce it i'm not even sure but Cy psilocybe cyanesens is the there you um, go is the the wavy cap but yeah you know how to pronounce Latin names, just to know, just I know. Whatever. There's, there's no absolute definitive right and wrong there. But with the topping up thing, I, I was sort of crossing my fingers, hoping they were going to top it up, and uh, and they did. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to October, November time <laughs> and walking down there. But yeah, the morels, though, they, they tend to get me. That's really interesting because I did know that they, they were part of the reason why. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the reason why they fruit so early is because they they spread and eat so fast compared to other mycelium. Is that correct? Is that partly why they're fruiting so early? I'm not about that. What I do know is the um, there's a I want to say there's a fairly rare species of morel in the UK, which actually it fruits in autumn time. Evolutionary terms um, uh, is is one of our old one of the oldest, possibly the oldest morel. In evolutionary terms, so you know, prefers those the kind of conditions when a lot of other, you know, more typical summer autumn autumn fungi might might be producing, mm. and 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 it may be that they that they adapted to to fruit in or in sorry in springtime, um, when there was, a, for example, I don't, I'm 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 not absolutely clear, mm. um, but they're 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 a fascinating group of uh, of fungi, that's for sure. But see, the annoying thing about the wood chip sites is that you might have great success one year, you know, unlike, you know, you stumble across a massive fruit in your porcini and you've got a site. Future mm. years, you can go back, you know, time and, and, and it won't deliver you know, in a big way necessarily every year, but you know that, you know, again, repeat exposure, you, you get a good return sometime. Shit morels. It's a one time only, you know, eat, you know, feast on all you can eat in a sense. Um, and then the next year, you've got to go and find a new patch. So finding wild morels is much more, is they're much more elusive. They're harder to find. But if you do find them, you've got the variety of future, future years then as well, potentially. Brilliant. What was one of your most memorable and exciting uh, truffle hunting experiences or coming across truffles? That you can probably tell, tell, tell you I can probably tell you a few and I probably 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 should and one thing I did want to say is that is that so um I I did a uh, did a fungi foray um, at a venue called Delamere Forest which is up in up in Cheshire I was working with the Forestry Commission there and doing forays over a number of years uh, at the end of one foray where my uh, there was a big mature oak tree nearby and I just thought I'd have a look, quick one if there's any interest underneath it it's fine. Was a the animal had been excavating. Hear what? But there's a little white thing popping through, um, and plucking it out. It was clear that it wasn't a wasn't a, a young stinkhorn egg. It wasn't a puffball. I think it inside. It had a completely different interior to any other white shaped fungus that I've seen beforehand. It was a species of truffle, um, and 
I tried to seek some support online to help to identify it, and it was, it was suggested it was probably one of a group called Hymenogaster. But I didn't get any, any further than that, and I thought, I need to know more about this. So I, I, I did some research and came across a book which is kind of aimed at mycologists, but it has it's kind of the, the most comprehensive resource that we have in the UK for identifying truffles. What, sorry, what was, the name, what was the name of the book, sorry? The book, um, I've got a copy of it. Now, you won't be able to see it because it's going to be in reverse. It's called Truffles. Um, uh, yeah, I and it's recognize by, the cover. Uh, Pegler, Brian Spooner, and someone young. Um, it's probably about the best part of 30 years old. Um, yeah. But actually, what it, it, that, that book's like a, it's a revision of, of a work done by, um, by a lady called Lillian Hawker. And Lillian Hawker was a, was a mycologist based at, at Bristol University. And in the years following the war, Second World War, she, she spent about five years, um, I think from 48 to 53 or something like that, focusing on truffles and trying to, try, trying to find more about, about truffles in the UK. And what she did is she, she employed her, her students and uh, explored a multitude of sites in Bristol and around Bristol, up into Gloucestershire, you know, all around Avon, I think into Somerset as well. And uh, what she felt were potentially suitable sites, you know, she'd take a team with her and they'd go and explore. And what samples they got, they take back. She put them under the microscope. She, she, she got some great photography and um, hand-drawn pictures of the microscopic features of the, of the different, different truffles. But actually, what, more than anything, she provided records for these mm. for these species, and so even even to this date, the, the majority of the UK records we have for truffles, different truffle species, are actually localized around the southwest, around around Bristol, because because she did so much work. So the fact that one person, you know, with a with a team of support, can you know, can provide such a wealth of knowledge about about what's going on underground, it kind of I think that. That talk that speaks to the um, to the fact that the rest of the, the rest of the UK has not had any kind of scrutiny in comparison, and actually we've got to have a wealth of, fun, of, of truffles all over the UK. Now, on the of reading this, I thought, hell, I need to go down to Bristol because that's clearly where all the truffles are. Yeah. That was my thinking at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I took a busman's holiday and I went down there camping for three or four days, and I, I, I explored. Um, a place in the, I think, Watton Over Edge, which is uh, an area in Gloucestershire in the in the Cotswold, um, went to some woods there, which apparently were wonderful for truffles. You know, back in the 40s or 50s. Um, what I hadn't appreciated is that is that as the trees age, the the viability of truffles, you know, diminishes. So you can still find truffles, but nowhere near as many as you can when they're these are typically a bit younger. Um, so maybe I went when they were, when conditions just weren't ideal or there just weren't, weren't many truffles around, but I didn't find anything there. The location that she'd had good success at was someone called Blaze Castle in Bristol. Okay. I uh, did a hell of a lot of digging around holes. And what time and of year is this? Is it summertime? In, or? It, was, it was now, it was, in, it was in the middle of August, okay. basically. Um, going back, what, seven or eight years, maybe. Um, and I found two species of truffle there. So one of one of the species I encountered was, which is one that I find fairly often in the UK, the small species in the same family as the summer truffle, it's tuber rufa, sometimes called the red cinnamon truffle. Oh, yeah. And you know these things are small; they're like you know half a centimeter up to maybe two centimeters in size. But if you get the larger ones and, and they're at maturity, they don't have any of those classic truffle tones. You know those those kind of things that you expect from particularly the, um, you know, the French black or the Italian white truffles, uh, you know, like garlicky notes or kind mm. of diesel smell, you know, there's, the, there's none of those qualities. Um, but what you do get is quite a strong smell of smoked almonds. It's got this smoky aroma and they taste great. I, I love smoked almonds personally. I find these small though they are, they, they come up very clean. I just kind of shave those over, over whatever I'm eating and just enjoy the flavor of Nice. Um, no one eats them in any way, but I enjoy them. I think they're, they're pretty, pretty nice eating, a fun little thing. Um, 
And I think I found a, a, another one of these hymenic gaster, small, small white truffles there. Um, and then I went to some woods called Savanac Forest, which I think is just over into Wiltshire. And Savanac Forest used to be a used to be a you know a, a prime truffling ground for one of the one of the last truffle hunters in the UK. I was had, had mentioned that, so I thought I'd explore it. Mission from Savanac Forest to do some digging around. I didn't want to you know dig in a site of special scientific interest and yeah. you know, dis dis disturb disturb anything that might be happening there. And they they, they kind of pinpoint some areas of woodland to explore, and I found masses of deer truffles the ones I, I spoke about before but uh but nothing else and this uh, this is just you yourself just going there and looking for the signs and just getting on your your hands and knees and having a little dig having a little dig yeah i mean so, so i mentioned before with grass areas you know rather than digging the turf up which as i say is not okay you put you can kind of pop your fingers in the holes if you're in in woodland where there's leaf litter on the ground then you know then there are dig, dig holes you know in a sense you could excavate a huge area with a rake or something like that but that what you're doing is you're, you're disturbing the you know all the microorganisms that live within those those upfill layers and with leaf litter and as soon as you start to penetrate the soil you're you know you're impacting upon the mycelium of not just truffles but also you know all sorts of different fungi like that, that, that so uh, I mean, I know the British Mycological Society, you know, who kind of main um, body for, for, I guess, conservation and interest in fungi in the UK, going back maybe 20 years or so, they uh, they did run some some truffle forays where they were doing a lot of excavation to see what mm. they could find, and then and then you know, thinking, hold on a second, this is okay. we have got to go out with the truffles. We've got to do it modestly. I, what I tend to suggest is if you find some dig holes, excavate maybe like a foot square, explore that space, have have a dig. You know, the truffles, if they're going to be be um, in the soil, they're going to be in the first two or three inches of soil. Usually they can be mm -hmm. further down, but, you know, if they're further down, leave them be. Don't disturb that that, that zone. So I typically dig no more than, than two to three inches down and then see what I can find. That's really important. So you're minimizing the localized impact upon 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 the uh, and and, so and would you would you only go to that stage of right? You see a dig hole, and I'm, I'm just trying to like uh, clarify, I guess, what is the sustainable approach to doing this, right? Would you see a dig hole? Would you before you start digging the square foot area? Would you would you first because uh, I know we spoke about this? Would you wait till you had a hint of a smell? Uh, from the truffle aroma or would you wait for that or would you just excavate anyway to see you know if the dig hole looked promising or is that a factor in your um you know checklist that you know getting the smell of truffle or something or I guess not if it's one of these species that doesn't necessarily have a aroma and that's what you're potentially interested in looking for as well well I mean if you're if you're looking for you know, your interest is solely in in the gourmet aromatic species. Then you can say, well, if the hot smell of anything, then I'm just going to ignore it. You, you know, you might miss out on some something interesting anyway. Yeah. You know, if you're interested in in kind of fungi more broadly, um, yeah. Usually, you're going to have. I mean, you can. Um, it's th th this is something that people people think you know, maybe it's slightly crazy, but actually, our sense of smell, whilst it's get your nose down to the ground where there are, where there are dig holes if there's something in the vicinity you if you sniff all around you look like an absolute loon to anyone passing by um but if you're if you're you know prepared to uh, to look slightly slightly crazy while sniffing the ground you will be able to smell where there's something of you know you kind of move from kind of different different you know the, the smell of soil um, Suddenly, there's something which might smell, you know, slightly sweet or slightly nutty or, you know, pungently aromatic. Um, some of the species you encounter, which, uh, which I've found using those, uh, you know, give off fruity aromas. So you get something that kind of smells distinctly fruity and it's worth having, mm. a, having a bit of a poke around. Um, I, I mean, a single hole, there, you know, may well be truffle, but if there's multiple big holes, the kind of size, 
in the leaf litter or soil litter, then then it's definitely worth having a little bit of a bit of a look. Um, and as I say, it's a numbers game. You know, there are truffles in some of those holes. So if you if you investigate a lot, you will ultimately find quite a few truffles. Awesome. And what's this about a Tesco's truffles? I'll tell you about this one. Oh, of course. Okay. So so this is you know. My, my folks, I was living in Manchester, my folks were in Macclesfield and I'd, I'd often drive drive to visit them. And on my route out of town, um, there are, there are I, I, again, I don't know if this is something you do, but as you know, a forager, but someone that's fairly, fairly mushroom obsessive, over the years, I'd, I'd end up taking detours of, I'd be on a route and I'd think, oh, that looks like it's got quite, quite a few nice, nice trees. And I'd go and drive it down. Over the years, I was finding, you know, I find some fungi and truffles. And uh, there was one one time I was driving to uh, to Macclesfield. Uh, I was low on petrol, and there's a Tesco's nearby. I could, pick, I could fill up, so I filled up. And uh, as I did so, I glanced. I, 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 as I came in to where the where I could get the petrol, there was a grassy area and a bank of a bank of green trees off to the side. We don't see a lot of hornbeam in Manchester. It's pretty common down south. Um, and I can look at people having a look just in mushrooms in general. There was some fairy ring champignon growing there. Um, I don't recall if there's anything else above ground, but I suddenly spotted all these dick holes around every single one. Like every other hornbeam tree had these dick holes. Pretty fresh. That's something actually. Um, you know, if the dick holes look fresh, they're worth investigating. If they've got cobwebs over the top of them, there's, there may have been truffles in the holes, but there probably won't be now. Um, but with these fresh dig holes, um, more truffles came out. Um, these guys are actually, um, this species, um, they're actually growing in fairy rings. You can see the dig holes were actually, you know, forming forming like the appearance of a fairy ring um, mm. in the grass. Um, and the now, something called the bath truffle. And the bath truffle has been, you know, Historically, I don't know, in the 18th century, possibly before then, um, in in the south southwest around Bath, this is a species of truffle that was sold at markets. Oh, really? Oh. And when it hits maturity, so they're quite interesting looking ones. They don't get massive. They get to you know, inch, inch and a half across at, at, at largest, um, and they can be much smaller. On the outside, they, they, they look they actually look of the truffles we have in the UK. They're the one that most looks like chocolate truffle they look like they're cocoa dusted on the outside and if you slice them in half they have this black slightly wet or maybe even slightly slimy in, in, in interior but the interior maturity has this incredible aroma of fermenting pears really nice really nice aroma um, now i've tried eating these as they are and i find the texture quite crunchy they're not you know they're not particularly exciting in terms of um in terms of of texture you know, is a as a nutrient source. Yeah, you know, there's gonna be there's gonna be some nutritional value that comes from it, but they're not. You know, how would you, how would you have eaten this? Would you have, you know, with a with a wet inner? How, how do you remember how you ate these these crunchy cocoa dusted? I I, I, I simply slice them up and slice. fry them in a pan. You know, the the standard treatment for any yeah. new species of species of fungus I'm sampling um, is to you know throw them in a the pan and uh, and and cook them up. Very simply, salt, butter, and see how they are. No, they were they were okay. They were kind of maybe would benefit from a long, slow stewing as in a casserole yeah. or something like that. Sure. Um, what I what I I've been doing is is collecting them, slicing them up, and sticking them with vodka. Mm -hmm. And the ethanol captures that those those kind of highly aromatic, fruity tones. You end up with with a, with a really nice, pleasant, coloured. Flavored liqueur with a bit of sugar added. You've got a liqueur going on, so that's 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 quite a thing you can do with the pear with the bath truffle. Um, bath truffle is it's a Latin name is Melanogaster brunianus. Uh, the reason I mention that is there's a relative of it called Melanogaster ambiguous, and for a few years I've not I've not encountered that one. Now there was one day I was in in another park in Manchester in South Manchester. Um, a place called uh, Fletcher Moss Gardens, where I've, I've been leading forays, you know, fungal forays for maybe 20 years. And uh, it, it was probably August time, it was summer. 
and I spotted some dig holes under a birch tree and I did a bit of excavation. And whatever had been eating the truffle had very kindly left the tiny little morsel of it, this little scrap, it was maybe uh, two millimeters by three millimeters. So I, I, I'm going to stick that under the microscope and work out what it is. So I took the little piece and I wrapped it up in a leaf. I got back to my car. I drove to the nearby nearby tram station. I, I had a, uh, a job in Manchester I had to get to. So I took the tram and tram to Manchester. Then I came back three or four hours later to my car, opened the door, and I was hit by this wall of stench. It was it smelled like like rubbish that has been sitting out in the sunshine for too long and is just putrid it was the most vile aroma uh, and it also smelled a bit like have you ever been past a a landfill site it smelled yeah. like landfill gases yeah. and it, deeply unpleasant and getting the spores under the microscope i was able to confirm that this was what's called the stinking slime truffle wow gas ambiguous and the chap who um uh, i think uh, going back into the mid 18th century, there was a, a reverend who was particularly into into truffles, and I'm, I think he was the one who first first identified and and um, described this species. And and in his description, he said a single specimen of this truffle can make a room uninhabitable. Wow, Abso absolutely true. I'm fascinating. I, I I haven't attempted to capture the aroma of that one. Yeah, I decided. To yeah, that wouldn't go so well in vodka, I don't think. It could be, could be a you know a comedy number potentially, you know, a little joke trick. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, other truffle finds. I said I moved to an area, Field, um, mm. which is in the Chilterns, and I moved here four years ago. And in the time I've been here, I've I think just in the village that I live, I live in a very small little village, it has about what, sixty or seventy properties, and it's a, it's a very small, quaint, quaint little village. I know grassy verges, and there are some some mature trees, and there's a small as well. And in my time in the village, I found some incredible fungi, but I found five different species of truffle, and uh, some some pretty cool ones. One of them popped up last year. Um, Big holes. I've got a couple of different trees in my garden. I can see squirrels foraging for things under the under the, uh, the boughs of the trees, and that's something to look out for. If you have a garden and you see a squirrel foraging around, digging little holes underneath trees or bushes that you have in your garden, make a note. Have a look. It could well be truffles, because quite often people find truffles in their own gardens. Yeah. By by investigating these holes, uh, a I found something, a small little orange truffle. Um, doesn't have a common, oh no, it, doesn't, it has a common name. It's called the, the spored balsamia. It's called balsamia platys, platyspora. It's just kind of little granular orange exterior um, and quite cool looking spores under the microscope. It's got no food value. You could eat it. Not very exciting. Um, uh, there's, there is here's the I mean, you know, if you're interested in finding the gourmet things. Um, I won't tell you tell you the name of the village I live in, but <laughs> doing a cycle around it looking for a book by one day, a few years ago, I spotted dig holes underneath the mature oak tree. And these mm. were big dig holes. And uh, at the time I was training my dog to um, see if she could find truffles. So I took her back with me a few days later and I Gave her the smell of a little bit of truffle oil and then said, go find like a wood And she was knackered at that point. She, you know, she, she wandered over the grass and didn't bother sniffing and uh, plopped on the grass. And so I thought, well, to hell with it. I'm going to have a look and started, started digging around some of these holes. And then I invited her back over and I said, come on, go find it. She kind of looked at me. She rolled her eyes at me and then she sniffed and then pointed. Oh, the holes were truffles. And they were black summer truffles. Oh, nice. Um, and so over, over the last couple of years, I've been reliably finding truffles at the same location. Um, my dog's gone off the boil. She she became a teenager, and I think I, you know, I didn't I didn't put the legwork in to continue her training. Uh, part of what I do is I work as a herbalist. I'm a medical herbalist. I have an interest in medicinal fungi. Um, 
is you know, that, that's that's a side that's you know that's half of what I do I guess and the other half of what I do is is um, foraging teaching and just general communication with fungi um, and I just felt stretched in too many areas and the truffle thing is you know training the dog and going out finding lots of truffles is quite appealing but I had energies in different different areas so I so I let it slip um, and so I've been you know finding troubles has become a job that i do now i don't you know, mm. she might be with me but she she's not going to help out um, and this year uh, a good friend of mine uh a chap called ali who's also known as the fungi guy he's got he's got an excellent um yeah. youtube channel and, and he's on instagram he he came down to visit and we Make a, make a trip over to to this regular spot where, where we can get the truffles. And there were lots of big holes again. It's, it'd been incredibly dry. So my expectations are fine, slim. We got them to the ground. And we, you know, it's not sniffing the holes, but also sniffing ground near the hole. And um, sniffing the holes yielded truffle. Yeah, we got black truffles, a couple of very maggoty ones, but, but one decent truffle. And pieces of truffle popped up. Something on the on the ground. It smelled like like a fermented caramel toffee. Absolutely delicious. This sweet, sweet kind of apple aroma coming out of the ground. And there was a small, tiny little, I mean tiny, about you know, one and a half centimeters round, little kind of white, creamy colored, and with brown blotches on, little truffle. Um, and I was excited about that, you know, picking, you know, with the Kind of amateur mycologist in me wanting to find out find out what that was and we got back home prepared the truffle cooked some scrambled eggs up and we had the the summer truffle on scrambled eggs and then we spent spent hours you know uh trying to work out what what this little thing could be and eventually we we, we pinned it down and it's something which it would be recorded three times i think in the uk since the, the 1860s or something like that oh wow uh, and actually in Europe, I think it has maybe in the whole of Europe, it has maybe a handful of records. Wow. This quite cool little thing, which is 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 in the same family as the Russia, you know, the, the brittle gill fungi that you know that we find around and I absolutely love eating. This is a little underground species of Russia. Um so that's that's pretty cool. Wow. Uh, oh sorry. Uh, no, it lost me there. There's another species of I found in a village uh, at the end of a uh, a run that I was doing. I was doing Couch to 5K, I think, at some point. And um, just as I was coming, I knew I was in the final legs of the run. I was running it, running along it. this lane just down below my house, passing down to the side. And I'm always, you know, scanning when I go. You're interested in mushrooms? Is that is that you know whatever you're doing? There's this kind of 180 degree, degree vision, and I can always always see things out of the corner of my eyes and as i was running past this oak tree i spotted a little white thing and i run ran maybe another another couple hundred yards and then and then it came to an end so i'm, I'm going to head back and see what that was and this was again it was a piece of truffle that was, was protruding through the soil um and it's one i recognized because i'd seen something very similar in the lake district a few years beforehand uh, getting under the microscope, I could tell straight away that it was it was something quite interesting. It was potentially the same species I found in the lakes. Something called I don't think it has a common name, but it's uh, called Octaviania astrospora, and astro meaning star-shaped spores. Astrospora. Oh wow! You get it under the microscope, and it has these incredible, you know, they are star-shaped. There's there's no question about it. These beautiful star-shaped spores. Um, but what was interesting about this species was that the um, the Octaviania, they're actually closely related to the boletes, so the boletus fungi, which include the porcini. And you'll notice that it's got some of the some of the boletes you find, you slice them in half, and they stain vivid blue. Meaning mm. that happens. And these guys, they're white. If they stain, they stain blue. But this one that I found, it stained pink. Oh wow. And then it stained blue. Um, and at the moment, you know, these days, I mentioned Lillian Hawker, who was the UK UK expert on troubles going, you know, going back to the you know forties, fifties. Um, uh, the the current UK expert on on truffles, you know, from a mycological perspective, is a lady called Carol Hopart, and I emailed mm. her to say, hey, what do you think about this? I didn't hear anything. Uh, transpired, she she changed email addresses. 
Oh. And I made contact with her early, earlier this year and um, about something else, about another species I've encountered. And um, uh, I, I asked her what she thought about this. And she said, well, that's almost certainly something distinct um, and probably not recorded for the UK yet. So I have a dried sample somewhere in the house and I haven't been able to lay my hands on it, but that's going to get sent off for DNA evaluation. So it could be something, something quite interesting. Oh, so you could have found a new species, basically. Yeah, it's unlikely. It, it, it might be a new species for, for the UK, but it's likely to be recorded elsewhere in, in, in Europe, I would think. There's a number of different species of, of Octaviania which are, which are found in, 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 in Europe. But it, as yet, I've not been able to pin it down. It's gone out DNA to be able to confirm. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. I was going to ask you as well, because I haven't yet flirted with the idea of you know getting a microscope as well and going down that uh adding that extra i guess um exciting level of research that you can do with mushrooms and stuff is to you know look at stuff under the microscope um but haven't yet done that is there is there um like what would you say to somebody who's thinking of doing that like is there a specific a specific microscope you should start with or um and also interestingly just talking about um you know there not being many people looking in certain parts of the country for truffles or probably other mushroom stuff as well like do we want to help nurture an, an army of amateur mycologists who are recording and looking for truffles and stuff to add to the, to the database i guess is what i'm sure of and then how how does one go about doing that? You know, if you find a unusual species, what like you just said you've had a dried species on hand, what what do you what's the next steps of like if A getting it checked out and B, I don't know, recording a new a new mushroom. I've not really had that chat with anyone before, but it there's sounds lot, like something that you there's a lot of questions in there. Yeah, you know? yes. Yeah. Okay, so so I mean on on, on the uh, on the subject of, you know, recruiting recruiting a bunch of people you know truffles why the hell not you know i mean mycology in the uk is a it's a dying breed you know there aren't any mm. any uh you know colleges where where we're learning you know ga gaining mycological skills is readily available if you know if you're if you're at university you know, the only mycology course you're going to do is is it's going to be related to, to pathology so it's going to be my these is fungal infections mm. If you're interested in in, in fungi, you know, amateur amateur mycologists uh, are the people who are providing the majority of you know of material for for research. And there is a mycology department at Kew, um, which which you know it, it has funding, but it's it's relatively limited. So the, you know the work they're doing is great, but it's it's not um, it's not fair to some of the mycological centres around around the rest of the world. You know, Europe, so having having people who just have an interest in 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 fungi in general are finding things if you if you're finding something it's worth trying to trying to find out my group is because there are a number of british mycolog mycological society fungal groups around the uk not all areas sadly have a bms group mm. uh, uh you know a specific group but but a lot do but pretty much every area will have have a recorder often somebody who's a who's a botanist who has has some mycological skills who who will be able to take take records on board and actually get them officially you know, loaded up to um one of the databases so that so that there's evidence there in future and i mean i'm a member of a couple of fungi groups i'm a member of the northwest group they're, they're a great collective and because i've moved down to Buckinghamshire. I remember the books from this group, and again, a you know, collection of, of excellent mycologists. Often, often with you know, because mycology or fungi, there's so many different different species. Mm. You, know, you can't really be you know, you can be a jack of all trades in a sense and a master of none. But actually, if you, you know, if, if someone does have a degree of mastery, it's usually within one specific area. For example, uh, Pennington, who's the, um, I guess the the chief of the um, Books fungus group. Her, her her specialty is a group of fungal fungus called the fiber caps, or the bees or inosides. Um, and she's she's a UK's leading expert on on that group. And I think she 
she actually found found one of these one of these growing in her back garden um, a couple of years ago, and knowing the the genus really well, she's like, this doesn't quite fit any of them. She got the DNA work done due to science, completely new species to science. So oh, you know, right. it's it's um that there, there, there are some there are some amazing mycologists. Uh, so if you're if you're a novice, often joining one of these groups is a really nice way of. Yeah soaking up some some skills um you know very kind of id focused rather than defocused but it's 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 a nice way if you if, if you're interested in mushrooms broadly you know i love the food aspects of wild mushrooms mm. but i'm i'm i probably love even more these days even more just you know geeking out you know nerding out some of the some of the really cool mushrooms do um so so that's certainly one thing to do in terms of you know, getting a microscope, that was one of your other questions. Um, I've got to say, personally, so for 30 years, I didn't touch a microscope, at least 30 years. I've only been using one for like the last seven or eight years. Um, and during that time, you know, 13, 14 years of that time, I was teaching fungal skills, you know, mushroom ID courses to, to the general public. Um, and I think what that says is that is that it's, it's possible to gain really, really, and you know, very good ID skills without using a microscope. Mm. And often, you know, once you get, you know, you've got your ID, your ID skills, you know, you can say say to you know somebody, okay, it's one of one, it's it's this could be one of three different species. They're all edible, or this is one of three different species. They're all poisonous. I mean, it's it, it's. It, I, if, if there are any instances where two species that look identical, um, well, there probably are actually. I'm thinking of one, but the two species that look identical actually have, you know, one's edible and one's not. Um, but in the UK, that isn't that isn't something we have concerns with. So getting a microscope is, I've got to say, it's fun. It 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 adds a whole new dimension to, you know, if you're used to used to identifying fungi by by looking at their key ID features, you know, in their in the macro state. You, you, in front of you. Um, some species that look really dull and drab and quite unexciting put them under the microscope and they come to life mm -hmm. you know that's where that's where the cool stuff is oh my god that's like that's that you know really cool sport shape for example of cellular structures um which which look it is it is like a you know looking in in like you know at, a, at an alien vision almost some of the things that you see under the microscope and i enjoy that um it's also you know to to identify things well under the microscope you genuinely need fairly expensive books so the microscope itself that you get you can get for 150 quid you can get a decent microscope that will that will give you a combined 1000 times magnification at the mm -hmm. highest level um and that's good enough to see spores of of a the Russia or the brittle gill, they have relatively small spores, and that's good good enough to be able to see the spores pretty well. So, so that's you know that's all you'd need. Um, but actually, having having books that have really good pictures or photographs of the microscopic features you're, you you might be seeing mm -hmm. under the microscope tends to that tends to be a bit more costly. Um, I would, I would, I mean, it, it, is it okay to, to throw some recommendations out for quite? Yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you've come across any of Jeffrey Kibbe's series of books. But Jeffrey Kibbe's, a, he's a renowned UK mycologist. He's got, you know, real passion, passion for, for fungi and lots of different, different groups that he has a real, real interest in, lots of different families of fungi. Um, if you, I, 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 as a forager, I'm going to assume that you've picked up Roger Phillips' Wild Food book at some point. Yeah, I've well, I've had one or two of his books. I'm not sure if it's that specific one. Okay, yeah. that that that's a book you you know. I, I think any any you should get. It's one of my fav, favorite books. Uh, uh, I can remember reading in this. I think mean, it came out in the mid '80s. I you know got a copy when it went pretty, pretty soon after it came out. And I can remember reading under he does he he enjoys eating quite a few of the Russellers as well. Mm. And he was talking about one one species, I think, in there called the yellow swamp bushula, which grows in damp birch woodlands. Um, it's got beautiful kind of egg yolk cap. They can grow in huge numbers. 
And I think in there he was saying that 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 Jeffrey Kibbe, you know, this was this was Jeffrey Kibbe's favorite edible mushroom. Wow. Was this, this yellow swan brittle gill? So Jeffrey Kibbe, you know, he was he was yeah. he's good mates or he, he was good mates with um Roger Phillips, who's you know sadly recently. Um and he's really well regarded these days. He's written lots of different books over the years, but more recently he's been putting together these excellent tomes on on fungi. Um, mushrooms and toastals primarily and he includes all the key the key families the milk caps the brittle gills the bolletes um some of the families with with, with uh, you know significant poisonous as well and he's he's brought out three of four um of a four volume set that he's he's been producing over the last four specifically on like the agaricus which includes the button mushroom mm. A group called the Trichalomas, which are called the Knights, which are a family that I really love. Um, began eating. There's some pretty special ones within that group. Uh, he's got um, a book on bolletes, uh, the milk caps, the brittle gills, and they're just brilliant, uh, really accessible. Um, but if you have a microscope, you'll be able to use them even better. I think these books are something like 20, 20 to 30 quid each. So it's an outlay. Yeah. But um once you've got them you've got incredible resources for the rest of your life pretty much the names of the fungi might change slightly you know there's, there's lots of renaming that happens but um i really love those amazing um i was going to ask you foraging um for me especially in the last you know few years um i've become much more aware about how it's you know so much so beneficial for you know mental well-being and you know just getting outside and and all that sort of stuff and I was, I was just wondering what's your what's your take on um uh I guess mental health these days and and people uh just getting outside more and foraging um and uh yeah what's your experience with that well I've got um I've got a huge amount or a fairly 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 robust amount of personal experience of of, uh, I mean, nature for me has been has been a sanctuary. You know, it became became a when I was when I was a kid in France. I guess I you know, made those early connections with nature. But over the years, it has been a space. Spending time in nature has has this soul nourishing quality, which um, is great if you're feeling good, and is invaluable if you're feeling if you're feeling crap. Uh, there have been times where I'm, I'm going through really rough times at various points in life, as we all do, and um, being outdoors in, in the natural world. And being outdoors in the natural world for stop being really, really valuable, but actually um, foraging, just that, the kind of, there's a purposefulness and a focus that comes with foraging, which um, for me feels, it takes me out of myself. So if I'm, if I might go into the woods feeling, feeling, you know, really depressed or you know distressed about something that's happening in my life, and as soon as I start focusing on the world around me, you know, that level of distress just, you know, just drops down, and often just, you know, disappears completely. And so the whole time I'm, I'm, I'm out in the woods, I feel, I feel great, and then afterwards I feel much better than I did beforehand. Mm. Um, and I think you know, so many people get get you know, have started to recognise this. I think during lockdown, people had time on their hands, but they were also experiencing a lot of a lot of anxiety about mm. you know what was happening. They were feeling feeling very vulnerable, and having that purposefulness of going out, being in nature, and then if you're adding foraging to the dimension, you know, all the better better for it. I think. Um, I think it's. Um, I don't know what your experience is. Is that is, is, is that something? Does does nature work for you on that level? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a big piece of the um, the formula, <laughs> if there is a formula for uh, mental health and like being very, you know, I guess uh, able to manage your emotions effectively, really, from from minute to minute, day by day. Because ultimately, I think it's it's not being able to successfully whatever that means uh manage your emotions which ultimately can lead to you know the behaviors or the cycle of um 
you know anxiety or depression or whatever it is that someone's going through i think it comes down to that um struggle with emotions to a large extent and i feel like just getting outside connects you to nature i mean for want of a better phrase and then it for, for, for a long time i didn't really know what this uh, word spirituality meant and i was associated it with something that was a bit hokey pokey and uh, almost religious but but actually um you know more and more and becoming aware that getting outside in nature and connecting to nature is a bit like practicing spirituality which effectively someone so i heard it defined really nicely um and simply and well, I was able to understand it and agree with it was uh it's simply deepening a connection with something that is greater and beyond you uh of which is sometimes quite hard to see that there is anything greater beyond you when you're stuck in your own little bubble of chaos or whatever it is that someone's going through um so yeah I think I think it it makes you a spiritual person <laughs> as hokey pokey as that sounds you know i wouldn't have even thought of saying something like that uh just a few years ago but um you know it's a bit of an identity thing isn't it oh i'm a spiritual person or i'm not a spiritual person but i generally think anyone who regularly gets outside and and stops and takes a second or two to to feel it and to let go of certain stuff or to just just be present as much as they can then they are practically well, they are practicing being spiritual. And I think, I think, I think that has a that's a big component to living a fulfilled, calm, you know, life where you can actually cope with life, you know, so without getting too deep. I mean, I feel like I've opened a can of uh, baked beans there. I could keep going, but <laughs> Um, but that, no. I, I think you've described described quite quite beautifully what the experience is for. I mean, I think you say you know spirituality may may, may come with some kind of you know hopes hopes patience, but actually you know, that that feeling that you get when you're you're kind of more than yourself mm. you know, because we are we are nature you know we are we are part of nature but we we're, we're, we're so disconnected and you know isolated in our own bubble of experience and the society that we have kind of reinforces that idea of you know us and them and you know everything yeah, else yeah. is external from us rather than actually part of the part and um when you're in the natural world it, it it does you know there's that sense of being plugged in but, but mm. into being part of the bigger picture um and it takes you out of your you know maybe maybe not necessarily petty but you know your little worries that you might be having yeah yeah no it's 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 powerful um and and it might be might be a slight slight slightly deeper conversation than you know than foraging but it's it's powerfully connected I know I know so many I mean I know, I know lots and lots of people in the foraging world and I think pretty much all of them will 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 kind of concur that they that there is some kind of level that that, that powerful connection of being part of something bigger being plugged in or feeling you know that maybe that that's their spiritual experience is is their their nature time mm. yeah it's 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 definitely starting to come together in my own head as well as a as a relatively, you know, I guess, startup content creator, like, you know, yes, I want to talk about foraging and mushrooms and all that stuff. But I'm also very passionate about, you know, because of struggles I've gone through of, of mental health and, and tied in with that, you know, developing oneself, personal development, mental health and foraging. And um, for a while, I didn't quite see the connection. But I think more and more, as I just talk to people like yourself, talk to other people um, who are you know, outdoorsy people, um, you know, everyone's got, got their own shit. And I think there is there is a lot of overlap. And um, at least for me, I'm finding a lot more clarity, I think, uh, in in uh, what, I'm, what my message is, really. Uh, it's sort of coming together. But, um, uh, I, yeah, I think, I guess I'm just um, having a little pause of, like, what am I, what am I talking about? But, uh, yeah, no, I think... Um, mental health and personal development and trying to live one's best one's best self one's best version of themselves you know to to try and do that i think without having some uh vehicle that is nature related is is um you're probably cutting yourself short um but yeah sorry that's, that's a lot of blab from me you might even have cut that one out <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, one, one, one thing I was thinking that would be, would be, I know, as a foraging teacher, you know, who, yeah. who focuses upon safety. Yes. Something that I think would be invaluable to 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 mention. You know, well, a couple of things. You know, one is that you know, bearing in mind that truffles grow underground and they rely on rely on usually you know mammalian some mammalian forager to 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 dig them up and to ingest them and spread their spores. Um, it's it's not in their you know in their evolutionary agenda to be poisonous. If it was, they wouldn't you know they they mm. die out fairly quickly. If all the foragers, whatever forage them, you know, died. So whilst all truffles are in a sense can be eaten, you know, some of them really, you know, like the stinking slime, slime truffle, you know, there are some you really wouldn't want to eat, and some that just are too small to be worthwhile or slimy, smell particularly appealing. So 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 you wouldn't necessarily want to eat them all. Um it's important to be aware that a a lot of fungi that you find in the woods, they actually start off underground. Mm. So even immature death caps can start off, and death caps in particular, they have they have a sac at the base, and they actually grow out of you know, egg egg shaped structure. And when those egg shaped structures are quite small, the primordial or the you know the immature immature you know, um, right, is actually in the soil. You, you know, you could, when you're doing excavation, come across something of that nature mm. and think, hey, well, it's round and it's white, it's a truffle. Yeah. And so it's, it's really important to be aware that, that if you, you know, if you slice them in half, you're looking for particular ID features within the interior of the truffle. This could be like, you might see marbling, like a slightly marble texture or, you know, wet slimy texture, like these, these slime truffles. But if when you cut it in half, you, you see what looks like um, the cross section of an immature mushroom, mm. they need to be left out. You can't just assume that anything that is found growing underground, that's round, is a truffle. The majority of what you see will be. It's a very um, good point. Yeah. So that, that's just, and, and if, for example, you did get a microscope, then that's the point where, because if, you, if, if you're going to identify a truffle, there are different bits of the truffle you might look at under the microscope. You might get a, a very thin shaving that includes a tiny little bit of the outer material. But usually, the, you go to areas to get a tiny little sample of the material on the on the inside of the truffle, which is where the spores are um, produced and get to majority. So you get a tiny little piece of that and you pop it under the microscope. If you're not seeing any spore-bearing structures or spores at all, microscope is possible to have isn't isn't a truffle it could be just an immature mushroom that hasn't got you know any of those features yet um so that's just a kind of safety aside um i've never found an immature death cat while seeking truffles that's, that doesn't mean yeah. they're not there and that you that you, you might not be the unfortunate you know you might be the unfortunate one so you know, be safe out there guys no it's a very good point very good point um i was just going to ask you Another quick question on, uh, because I know obviously you being with your medicinal background as well, just specifically as it relates to to, to mushrooms, um, do you have uh, a, a, do you use medicinal mushrooms? Yeah, I use a, I use I use a fair few medicinal species. Um, I'm most of the species that I use are ones that I that that I can forage in you mm. know reasonable amounts for use in clinic without you know impacting their 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 future presence you know i, I kind of i'm i as most foragers should do as foragers should do is you know harvest modestly and you know, harvest mm. but for your needs making sure you're leaving plenty of immature and mature specimens and um, uh and yeah I, I harvest quite a few different species um what what's your go-to Go to species you harvest, and how do you actually turn it into a? a how do you then turn that into a, a, something you can? Into take? a medicine. Yeah, there, medicine, medicine. There are, I mean, there are different ones that I. There are maybe a trio of species which I, which I, that I harvest myself. Um, turkey tail is the obvious one. That's that's a really common species. Mm. And so I think in Japan it's called kara, karawi taki. Um, okay. it, there's a, it's the most researched of all the medicinal species. Of yeah. Um, and 
with that species, it's basically or it's primarily the hot water soluble um, complex sugars, um, polysaccharides that are that are found within the mushroom that exert medicinal effect, and they elicit a kind of cascade of immune positive immune immune effects, um, and they're used for a number of different cancers primarily but also used for some autoimmune conditions. So uh, to help to regulate or normalize immune function, um, they have antiviral activity. So that's one, one that I prepare by stink drying, shredding into small pieces. Um, and How are you tend, shredding it? How do you shred it? I tend to use a, a Nutribullet. I'd, say, I'd okay. say grinding, but it doesn't really grind. It becomes this kind of fluffy material. Yeah. Um, but I get a, you know, collect enough to make it worth making a batch. And then I, I put a uh, particular amount in a slow cooker and I leave that um, heating for about 18 hours, something like that on the low level. And at the end of that time, you've got fluffy kind of cream colored turkey tail and water at the beginning. And by the end of it, you've got a nearly black colored, thick, sticky extract, um, which I preserve with a small amount of ethanol. And then that, that's like a, a mushroom tincture, which is is then added to blends of other either mushrooms or other herbs, and given and, to patients. And, and with that, when you add the ethanol, what's the ratio that you use there? Do you is it like more ethanol to fifty fifty? Well, I've, I've not done I, this, I, sir. No, no, I've got, I've got, um, uh, I've got an ethanol license, which basically means that I can, I can store. 96% grain ethanol. Um, so I use 25% grain ethanol, 75% of this liquid extract of the turkey tail. Now, if you don't have access to 96% ethanol, you can get it from some Polish supermarkets. Eastern European supermarkets will sometimes sell 96% um, strength. You, you pay quite a bit on it because you're paying tax duty on it as well. Okay. Um, but you could use you could use a high strength vodka. Yeah. But you're looking to end up with about 20, 20 to between 20 and 25 percent overall, because if it's much less than that, then it's not preserved. Yeah. Um, so that's the turkey tails one I use. I, I, I do use quite a lot of that. Um, you know, one thing which which I find it's really good for um, as an antibiotic, it's really good for sores, people who you know, get, get, get herpes, herpes outbreaks, either, you know, um, you know, cold sores or or even genital herpes can respond really well to this. So, so that's quite an amazing medicine. Um, and applying it directly on the the sores or just ingesting taken, it? Taken internally, yeah. Taken yeah. internally as a medicine, it, it's um, it stimulates the immune system quite. Wow. Have, have these you know direct antiviral effects against herpes species. Um, the other species that I really like collecting and and using is one that you you may have collected yourself, hen of the woods. Yeah, is highly gourmet mushroom. I mean, it's interesting yeah. actually. You know, of the you know the the bolly, bolly mushrooms, uh, there was a, a study quite a number of years ago which evaluated the um, stimulating effects of a number of different bollies, and the one that came out came out highest amongst those that they assessed was Boletus edulis, which is a porcini or sep. And so that is, you know, that's a good medicinal species. Wow. But I can't imagine imagine many foragers collecting it and making medicine with it rather, <laughs> yeah. ra rather than just eating them. And, yeah. you know, it, it's similar to some extent that it tastes absolutely amazing. It's, it's, it's a good species. It can go quite large. And over the years, I, I maybe know a couple of hundred trees that produce, produce you know, decent. And of the woods, not necessarily every year, but you know, every two or three years. So it's quite easy to collect and you know, collect empty for medicinal use. And I always eat a little bit of it, but mostly I collect it, dry it, and then similar kind of extraction method to turkey tail, making this thick black, incredibly tasty. Uh, I mean, turkey tail, I don't like the taste of it. It's got it, it's it's mushroomy, but with it, some strange tones. It's a bit bitter mm. as well. Um, but the the maitake or hen of the woods extract is absolutely delicious, and man, that is an immune boost and a heart. That's an, it's incredible for 
which is in the bud. Um, it's oh, it's great stuff. Um, and so oh. I make quite a lot of that, and I use it, you know, with patients who really need that kind of support. Yeah, I think I think this year I would like to um, have a couple of medicinal mushroom projects on the go. I did collect a load of uh, turkey tail last year, dried it out, and then just just didn't do anything with it. It's still there. I've also got some. Um, I actually, uh, I was, I nearly had one of the most excited moments of my life foraging when I found uh, a big bit of uh, chaga on a, on a silver birch tree, um, and later I found in similar woods and down south. I didn't think they were down here, you know. Uh, I, you know, forever I'm staring at blooming silver birch tree burls or bills, however you pronounce it, thinking it's a blooming piece of chaga, but it's not. Um, but I have found a few down here, which is pretty exciting. But um, I've I've had one of those on my shelf for nearly a year now. So I, I was going to ask you a question whilst I had you on here. It was because that thing is fairly dry to begin with, really, and quite dense and solid. And I wondered if I've left it too long to maybe do something with it with medicinal properties. Or you, you're you're shaking your head, so I'm guessing that. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's, it's still good to go. I mean, but bearing in mind that um, that chaga is known to be profoundly antioxidant, mm. so so if it's a bit old, you know, it, if it's antioxidant, it kind of inhibits the aging process. So it kind of it, okay. it can actually preserve it'll preserve longer species. Something I should just mention about turkey tail as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to chaga. Is that is that um, turkey tail? Attached to um, to the bark of bark of a of a dead dead tree, so usually dead or or dying tree, um, is often bedeviled by by tiny little wood growing beetles that lay the eggs on the turkey tail itself. And when you harvest it, the eggs may be there, but they might not hatch down. You dehydrate it, and then you stick it into a bag or a jar for later use, and you come back to it later on, and it's just sawdust. Mm. So the thing to do is if you if you collect it either before you dry it out or after you dry it out, give it about a two week window in the our eggs in there they're destroyed and then you, then then you haven't wasted your time and your effort. Yeah. Um, so that's a kind of practical consideration with turkey tail. Um, the chaga is so it's got a kind of black gnarly almost burnt looking exterior and that part is incredibly tough. Mm. And it's got this kind of slightly more um, golden brown interior, um, which is a bit softer. Um, it can still be very hard. Uh, and the, I guess one of the biggest challenges is how to break it up and to get it, you know. I mean, if you've got, if you've got a very sharp axe and you're in areas and you have the outside and you know, chop smaller pieces. Yeah, not, not sure the Nutribullet's going to do it. <laughs> Some, well, or, or did it? So the Nutribullet can do a pretty good job. But what I would say is I, I've used them over the years and I have gone through too many of the of the um Nutribullet cups. Yeah. To uh you know to mention I'm 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 not I'm, I'm you will break them if you do that. But you can actually get uh I discovered last year you can get metal Nutribullet cups. Oh nice. So get one of those and using your blade. Uh, you might find that you can actually grind it down to a fairly, fairly fine powder. Um, the powder you can then just use, you know, you can make a hot water extraction by simmering it for, say, 15, 20 minutes and drinking that. You can stick it in high strength. That really needs, ideally, like 60% alcohol to get a, to, to get a, so, so what you would do with, with chaga is, what I, what I do with making chaga extraction is to, Put the have the powder and put maybe three times, three or four times as much, sixty or seventy percent alcohol with it. Leave that for a couple of weeks. Extract the liquid off that. Keep it aside, and then with the wet, the wetted chaga powder, heat that up with water, a similar kind of. Water, and after a couple of hours of simmering, strain that liquid off and mix the two liquids together. And you get what's called a dual extract. So what you've done is you've extracted mm. particular compounds with the, the high strength alcohol, but you can't extract with water. And when you made the water extraction, you've, you've taken the water soluble components that high strength alcohol won't take out. So you get the best of both worlds. 
yeah that that did always um confuse me that you've explained it very very well there um as to what dual extraction means that's brilliant so it's not too late then for the chaga and uh so i've already got two what about the the turkey tail because the turkey tail that i've dried up last year is still dried up from last year that's still good to go do you think still good to go yeah awesome. yeah it's, it's it's uh they 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 preserve i mean as a herbalist what what i was i was old in training is that generally dried herb material will last particularly if it's kind of fairly lightweight stuff like leaves or flowers will last you know 12 to you know to 24 months one or two years from harvest mm. before it starts deteriorating significantly if it's stored correctly if you put it in, in in direct sunlight it's going to speed up how quickly everything breaks down um bark and root maybe last a bit longer most of the fungi are much tougher than barks and root or as tough so so they'll I'm, my sense is the shelf life four or five years comfortably possibly longer because in a sense with the mushrooms the you know the bits that you're using aren't necessarily like in a plant like a palm or something like that the active ingredients are usually kind of these volatile components that give the smell of the plant so you know the essential oils they don't preserve very long actually mm. the bits that are you know, in a sense some of the most powerful components of the mushroom are actually the cellular the parts that actually make up the structure the cellular structure of the mushroom itself rather than you know you know that, so, so they're found throughout the whole mushroom um extensively and so if the if the mushroom's still intact then they're likely to be able to get those the structural components awesome um just going to begin to wrap up now. I'm really appreciative of your time. I know we've gone fairly long, but uh, I just wanted to ask you probably one of the more difficult questions, which is, um, and you might have to break this down into different uh, categories, but do you have a favorite mushroom? And I think I'll just extend that question out to say, um, well, you can give me two or three if you can't pick one, but maybe a favorite mushroom to eat. Um, and maybe a favorite medicinal mushroom i even have to break it down i have a favorite mushroom to to well truffles are probably going to take over everything very soon when buddy and i start finding those but um my favorite mushroom oh i'll start with mine then my favorite mushroom to forage at the moment maybe it's just because we've had a dry summer and there was plenty of them is chicken of the woods i just can't it's just one of the most exciting things to be walking through the woods i find and from a bloody fair distance away you can then just get a flash of orange gold and you can be like boom chicken in the woods and just that whole um uh hunting with your eyes sort of aspect to it is is brilliant it's not my most favorite i think to eat but uh, i think it's just bit quite varied i think with depending on whether you get it really super young how much water content is in it and stuff like that because i've found it quite bawdy a little cardboardy a little bit sometimes but I digress. Um, yeah, I think I think for me, favourite eating one has just got to be the porcini, but um, that's just pretty standard answer, isn't it? Um, in fact, sorry, I've I've actually jumped ahead of myself. I did. Um, I asked myself this question a few days ago. What what is my? And I've just forgotten what my answer was. But it's the cauliflower fungus. I think that I put that above even the porcini, and um, I was reading. Um, John White, John Whittles, uh, the guy who did the River Cafe, River John, Cafe, John Wright, John, yeah. John Wright. Sorry, there. Mm. I was rereading his description of um, of it, and uh, he said it's like, um, oh, paraphrasing whatever he said, but he said it's like uh, nutty aroma, really nice flavour, but it's like frying up taggy telly. You know, the texture of like taggy telly in a mushroom, and it's. I think for me, I, I haven't been able to really surpass that. Um, although I'm sure I'm, I'm, I will have experiences that will surpass that. But for me, that's my favourite eating one at the moment and favourite finding one at the moment. Probably all going to change um, as we approach. But yeah, what about yourself? And uh, why? Great, great, great question. And I'm, I'm why? Okay, so my kind of um, favourite edible species. I've got to say my kind of, I, 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 I don't have a strict, strict number one. Generally, yeah. cauliflower fungus, I agree, is one that I don't find anywhere near as often as hen of the woods. I absolutely love hen of the woods, mm. um, cut into thin strips, and you know if it's super tender and cooked crispy around the edges. I mean, it's it's like a, it's like 
chicken, I guess. Mm. It's just, just super tasty. Um, but when I've not found cauliflower fungus for a while, I, I start to hanker after it because it's exactly it's those noodly qualities you just mentioned. Mm. It's like, I don't know, Chinese noodles for me or something like that. It's, it's, uh, and it's got this, because they grow with conifers, there's, and most commonly pine, uh, it does have this kind of piney notes to it. Um, I, I, I love cauliflower when you know, I'm lucky enough to find to find a good chunk of that, and that's um, that's a treat. Uh, but I'd I, be. It sounds like I've had the opposite problems here. I, I find quite a lot of cauliflower and hardly any uh, head of the woods. So um, anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I I would say in the, I, you know talking about this kind of varying kind of top top position um truffles are great i really enjoy them they're not in the top five of, of wild options um even really good ones although saying that i i should add that there was there was a there was an incident really kind of interesting incident fun quite fun when i was um maybe 10 years ago 10 no it must have been about seven eight years ago i was teaching um a homeschool collective in north yorkshire and we'd go and do different forays in different locations. And when it came to autumn time, somebody said, said, hey, you know, I, I know I know some woods near me that are really, really great. You know, we should go there. So I time up to meet them on that day. And we walked up through the woods and there were quite a few mushrooms. And we we kind of worked our way up to the uh, to the tops where we were up in some moorland. Where we came out, there was there was a conifer plantation. It was a mix of pine and larch. And uh I have to go and have a quick mooch around there to see what we find. And lo and behold, there were dig holes all over the place. Mm. So this group of kids kind of talked about truffles and got them excavating. And, and lo and behold, these truffles kept popping out. There were small little white ones. They were maybe up to about two centimeters across. Um, and some of them had a cracking smell. When I got them home, and uh, sort of, you know, some of the kids insisted on taking a few of them home, but there were lots of them. Um, Got back home. I mean, the drive was 50, 60 miles to get to, to, to find them. So I, I never made it back. Um, and it reminds me, I should probably head back at some point. It trans transpired there, there are species called Tuba borkii, which is also known as the Bianchetto mm. in Italy. And is, it's, it's nowhere near as pungent as the Italian white truffle, but it's the most pungent truffle we have in the UK. And the ones that, were, that I, I kept a few of them in the fridge for a few days. Okay, meteoric they were absolutely delicious so that's my best wow. edible truffle truffle i've had was randomly uh, with 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 a homeschooling network that we encountered and, and and sorry where were those woodlands you said <laughs> yeah the, the, a neat little spot in Rewind. Rewind. Right. i think i'll probably be able to find the email yeah. that gave me the instructions to remind yeah. me where i'm going if i head that way again yeah um, but but I, I i should say within my within my top five um are Definitely morel, morel mushrooms, mm. and there is there's a it, you know it's it's interesting that you know some species are really tasty, but actually not hugely exciting to find. Mm. There isn't necessarily there's not a direct correlation between between how how exciting something is to find and how good it's going to taste. Yeah. There are some species that are hugely exciting to find, but they're pretty mediocre when it comes to taste. But I don't know they're just really, they're really fun to fun to see. Yeah. Um, and morels are uh, uh, they they hit both heights. The you know if there was wood chip ones that actually are I mean gosh there was one year um, I think we go about four years spring four years ago um, I was driving back and back and uh, and forth up, up and down the motorway from um, to to Manchester over over window of time I was having some chemo for a, for a for a treatment I was having. I had to go up every every two weeks, and it just meant that I had the the freedom of as I was driving of either up or down, making diversions to potentially viable wood chip sites. And that spring, I found fruiting morels on forty different locations. Wow! And and that might sound crazy, but that's purely a reflection. I probably looked at about. 85 or 90 different different sites and almost half of them had had morels fruiting on them and it may have been a particularly i think it was a particularly good spring that year you get a very mm. dry spring they don't grow very well 
it, it also highlights that that you know it's a numbers game. If you're looking at the right kind of wood chip, you've got to know what what that magic mushroom before, and they they grow on deciduous wood chip primarily. But it's always on conifer that you're going to find the, mm. the 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 morels, and they're great. I mean that year, gosh, I I had um, morels in the double kilos, uh, sorry, in the double figures um, of kilos. I mean there 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 were. It was, it was a great, fabulous year, but it was a reflection of taking advantage of the opportunity that presented me. Um, but I've got to say, the whilst the, the black morels that you find on wood chip are very good, the what are called the common morels, there's Morcella esculenta, Morcella vulgaris. There are others related yeah. to those two that are, are in the UK, but you won't read about in the books yet because current kind of understanding of UK, UK morels are reasonably thin on the ground um you know there's there's uh there's dna work being done um but it isn't it hasn't you know all the conclusions haven't come out yet but but the two species that are called the common morel which are both far uh, incredible eating my god and there's one location in the northwest um where i've been i've been finding um this one of one of those species of common morel for i don't know best part of 10 years something like that um, on one year i went to this to this this site which sometimes the food teams be very localized they'd just be you know five or six in in one area and, and other years if the conditions were good they'd be peppered around and actually you know whether a field i might find you know 20 or 30 of them this one year i i uh, i went to an area where i found one the year before and there were maybe 70 Wow. Of these massive morels, and um, that that blew my little mind. You know, I mean, I, I'd I'd had before I ever found morels, I dreamt of finding them. Just dreamt occasionally. I mean, I, you often foragers talk about, oh my God, dreams about about picking mushrooms. I was thinking about finding, you know, the mother load of porcini somewhere or something of that nature. And I I would dream every time. I don't know. I'd have five or six nights would be would be you know full of these hugely exciting dreams of finding loads of morels um and I started finding them this is kind of before i'd ever found them then i started finding yeah. them even even when i dreamt about finding morels i'd never dreamt about finding a mother load like that in the uk because that's pretty rare it might be something you see if you watch videos of people finding morels in the united states yeah where in some areas they're much more common but in the uk they're, you know they're very kind of rarely encounter or fairly rarely encounter thing and usually in modest amounts so that that blew my mind my god it tasted good as well <laughs> oh my gosh that's amazing yeah i have similar dreams so um so yeah just wanted to ask you as well um any any sort of parting words or tips or um bits of advice that you would give to uh, an aspiring wild food and mushroom uh, forager um, yeah here, here's one thing um, because because food becomes the focus the idea of you know foraging you're looking for food um, it's okay to go out looking for food and to find something that you're pretty sure is edible and to not eat it absolutely fine to do that even to leave it in the woods it's, it's better better to have be overconfident and take the risk of eating something you're i mean here's the thing if you're 99.9 percent .9 certain about your identity of something in a sense that's not good enough if you've eaten the thing you're 99.9 .9 certain of once you've eaten it that 0.1 percent of uncertainty isn't just 0.1 percent certainty that becomes all you think about and and i've encountered so many people who have made themselves psychosomatically ill because there's been a tiny little hint of doubt mm. so don't take any risk for one and as i say much better to because because if, if if a species you encounter which does not better that you find it encounter it get familiar with it don't eat it on three, four, five, six occasions, and by the time you've seen it three, four, five, five or six times, you probably almost certainly encountered, or well, there's a good chance you, you'll have encountered poisonous stuff alike. And when you see it, because it's 
seeing something in a book is very different from actually the tangible thing of having it in your hands. You can have an edible one in one hand and the poisonous in the other hand. And you look at the pictures in the books, you think, God, they look so similar. Uh, and you can smell them and you can feel them, you get a sense of the texture and, you know, bird is called the, the jizz of a bird. It's that same kind of thing. You know, pieces have a, have a different feel. And that's something you can't describe in a book. It's only experienced by actually encountering them. And so there's, there's real value in, in, um, in, in encountering and gaining insight. Because every time you encounter it, even if you don't eat it, you're gaining something. Mm. You're, putting, you're deepening your relationship with it without having to do that thing of putting it in the mouth and eating it just because it says it's edible in books. It probably is. So that, that, that they'd be my main kind of main words of wisdom for anyone starting out. Brilliant. Uh, some good advice there for sure. Um, I know that I've actually been f fallen foul of ha having the hundred percent rule on a couple of times, but uh, I think that's just part of my nature—a bit more risque. Um, there was a time when I, I yeah, maybe we shouldn't go into it, but uh, it's finally preaching the wrong thing. It's definitely not. Um, yeah, I won't go into that story. Um, but anyway, it's been really great having you uh, on on the podcast. And um, I, I know there's a, a much bigger amount of knowledge in your brain that has come out in just this last, you know, 90 minutes or so. Um, and so we may even have to do a part two or something. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to really um, just say thank you very much and and ask you as well is that if there's anybody listening wanting to go and find out a bit more about yourself um where can they go to how can they get in touch with you and and yeah yeah i'm i'm on um i'm on instagram uh i'm on facebook but i've got my i've got my own website which is just my name.com yes uh, which is a website which is kind of the primary focus is herbal medicine on there but on the tabs on the side i've got wild wild food mushrooms some content um and events uh this autumn i'm not running just recovering from a from a condition um mm. i've decided to just take the pressure off and not not this autumn which is really hard for me to do because because mm. i'm i i nothing i love more than being being out in the woods seeking mushrooms um if anyone i mean there are obviously loads of different online um groups where you can get you know identification advice but if you know if people are interested in you know sharing pictures of things that they're finding out in the woods i'm very happy to receive email uh, with pictures and i can you know if if the pictures are up, up to uh, the standard necessary for identification i'm happy to offer thoughts um very you know, very freely and what is that standard <laughs> just because i'm thinking about myself here so what... well i mean the, the you know Thanks very much for organising this, Ben. And I, and I, you know, looking at the, you know, pre watching the the previous podcast you've done with you know, into the world of truffling, it's fascinating to get, you know, to see lots of different different people's experience and mm. uh, you know stand, standpoint. Very happy, happy, uh, you know, for, for you if you if you're out in the woods and you you find something, just what's at me a picture um, if you want if you want any pointers there and then. Or, or take some photos and uh, you know ping them over, um, because it and there is that thing where where sometimes you find something that looks really exciting but you just not behind, um, or just take a small bit for identification and you come back and you think oh god it was incredible, mm. um, but I'm not gonna get back to the woods for another 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 two weeks because I've got such a busy schedule. Um, I'm sure. Awesome. Well, I will do. Thank you for thank you for offering. Um, well, on that on that lovely note, um, we'll bring this to an end, and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll stay in touch, no doubt. And um, yeah, thank you so much again for for being a great guest on the show. Great, lovely to speak. Cheers, Ben. Take it easy.